Hi, I'm Tom. I'm Matty. And I'm Lewis. This is the Wigan Way, Wigan's favourite rugby league podcast. Today, we're joined by a man who probably defines Wigan Rugby League. He made his debut in 1993 and played over 14 seasons at the club and over 300 appearances. Um, Post-retirement, he's held several roles at this club, including his current role as CEO of the club. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining us today. I'm really glad to be here. Really glad to uh, to talk rugby. It's good. Um, so I want, I want to start before before you made your debut and, and the life of a, a young Chris Radlinski. How how was it growing up around the town? You're Wigan born and bred. How how was it? Um, look, I'm sat here with with three fans, so I was a fan like you guys. Um, I was a home and away supporter. Um, obviously, grew up in the town through a very very successful period. Um, at a time where kids played rugby in the dinner hour at school, and you took a rugby ball to school every day with you, um, and it was just it's what you did in Wigan. Yeah was follow Wigan and play rugby, so um, it's always been part of my life, um, obviously from a professional point of view, but before that I was uh, I was a pretty mad fan, like you guys. Mm. So uh, how, how was your academic side at, at school and, and growing up, was you quite strong in that area or was rugby always the plan? No, I was, no, I was, I could, I, I was okay, you know, I, I enjoyed school, mm. um, I loved, I loved rugby. Um, and I committed myself wholly uh, to be to become a rugby league player. But uh, I enjoyed school. I went through uh, all high school at St Thomas More, just across the way there. Um, enjoyed it, left with good qualifications. Then I went to John Rigby College. Um, and then I did probably about a year and then I signed for the academy. Yeah. Uh, and at that time it was just becoming a bit more professional. Mm. Um, so I couldn't finish my college course. This was at a time before um, welfare and education was given such, you know, mm. prominent. Like we in our program now, uh, we'd work around college programs. But back then, it was give everything to your to your rugby career. So I couldn't finish finish my education. Mm. But um, I guess I got my education through through rugby league and through the club at an early age. So yeah. when did you um, start playing rugby then, Chris? When was it that you kind of? Uh, under 11s, Wigan St. Jude. Wigan yeah. St. Jude, yeah. Um, coach, uh, who's now one of my scouts here, a guy called Ken Owen. Um, played with him. Uh, and some great friends. Like I said, it was a community rugby league. I mean, it's still pretty strong now, but back then there was, you know, it was yeah. every every rugby club was booming every Sunday morning. So it was it it was a a really good a really good schooling program for me, um, and I enjoyed my time there. And still got a lot of friends from them days. Really good. Um, I want to ask you. you obviously, stated that you're you're a fan first. Mm-hmm. Do you have an earliest memory that sort of stands out for you that was that, that got you hooked on this game? Well, do you know, obviously, a few weeks ago we had we had World Club, um, and what we were saying in the build up to it, you know, the whole, I guess, the whole day was was probably done by um, myself and. Stuart Frodsher, a media and marketing guy, you know, we sat down and we wanted to create something uh, that people are still talking about 30 years later. And that's that's obviously what happened against Manly in that, in that day. You know, people are still talking about that incredible night. And that was one of my earliest memories. I went, I went there, you know, I can uh, even just talking about it now, I can still smell the fireworks in the air and all that kind of stuff. It was just, it was, uh, you know, Central Park was a, you know, magical place. Um, and we wanted to do something actually for World Club that that, that people are uh, still talking about, and uh, you know, kids will be talking about in, in thirty years' time as well. As a little bit of feedback on that, yeah, I, I think a win always helps. Yeah, yeah. But everybody we've spoken to was talking in those terms mm-hmm. that as an event, that was up there with the manly yeah. uh, game, 
and will be talked about for 20, mm. 30 years, whatever since. Uh, obviously, the Cronulla game, we won. It just didn't have that feel that, that this one did. No, no. Um, I, th- I, th- I think, the, obviously, the game helped, the ending. Yep. <laughs> so I think that helped. Um, but we did we did a good job. We did, did a great job selling out you know, mm. a month in advance. Um, there was a lot of hype. Penrith were amazing to work with. Um, you know, right from the, there's not there's not a kind of um, set formula. You know, you win the World Club yeah. and then it's like, okay, we're playing. I'm like, super it, league, super league don't really get involved. The NRL don't get involved. Is it as simple as that? You pick the phone up and talk oh, yeah, to yeah. each other. So I was I, I went on holiday um, and while I was while I was away, I, I picked the, introduced myself to the Penrith chief exec and negotiated a deal with with them. Probably took around about three or four weeks. But the Super League and the NRL, they just kind of overlooked it. Um, yeah. And then we, we had to put it together, you know, we had to put full budget together, um, get sponsorship, all this kind of stuff, have trophies made. You see, I, I find that absolutely mad that for what possibly should be the biggest game of the year every year, the two best sides from each competition yeah. playing each other, it's our equivalent of the Champions League final, whatever you want to yeah. compare it to, to just sort of... Yeah, go and, go and sort well, out yourselves. Well, it's a bit strange. Do, 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 you know, do you know what? The um, obviously we get to the grand final, and then I have a week at home, kind of tidying things up, and then I, I get you know about ten days ago away. Then, but in them ten days, I had to organise this, and then while I was away, I get the um, I get the email about um, Richard Ashcroft, and you know this is so, something I've been working on for ten years. Mm. So I get the phone call about this, and then. Whilst the, the the guys emailed me said, "Oh, we've got somebody else uh, who wants to sing, but we, we can't tell you over email." So then, I, obviously, I come back from a holiday and first day in work, and we have a meeting, and he comes and says, "Yeah, it's Noel Gallagher." And I'm like, "Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding?" Um, but no, it was, them ten days, we obviously got we got the concerts done, and we got we got the World Club. But yeah, it's just just a phone call. Um, this and like you've got to have a bit of get up and go about you. You know, mm. it's like. I don't think, I don't think probably the Super League or the NRL would would actually be that bothered. I guess if if, if it didn't take place, you know. But what what the game showed was there's there's an appetite, but also there's tremendous value in it. You know, it was a um, sellout, massive occasion, great entertainment, flashing goalposts, which we've been trying to get for a while, which was which was amazing. Um, I'll get them back before the end of the season because I think you know more people spoke to me about then than anything but it's little things that people catch on and it'll have just oh, yeah. sort of they've done all this planning yeah. for the event last up goal post is the thing that caught the eye like you know the, the, the week <laughs> after I said I need get, I need them back and uh, he said oh they're in Los Angeles I said what <laughs> they actually went to Los Angeles these things so I'll get them back before the end of the season they were they were pretty cool this is what happens when you talk about Manly this is what happens when you talk about the Penrith game now yeah. you get distracted I think back to Chris's mm-hmm. uh Beginnings down yeah. at uh, St Jude's and whatever. Mm-hmm. What, um, where, where did you stand in, in compared to your peers? Was you always towards the top? No, no, of those? no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. I, um, there's a lot of talented players around, but I just, I, I guess I always had, I always had work ethic. Mm. Yeah. So even even when I was a kid, I don't think anybody, anybody would work harder than me. It's something I, I like to display to my kids now. You know, the, my kids. I include them a lot in what I do here because if I didn't, they'd probably never see me. So I'm very lucky with uh, current chairman and, and Ian and, and Mike that they've allowed me to um, bring my family on the journey as well because you know it's it's a pretty old consuming job. You know, it's ninety hundred hours a week, but it's it's a tremendous privilege. But it's work ethic that's what gets you anyway. Is that work ethic? Do you think something? That you've always had, or was it rugby that kind of almost helped instill that? Do you know what I'm trying to? Trying to, trying to it's a bit like yeah, no, no, I, I get, I get, I get the question completely. Yeah. I think, I think rugby, rugby gives you a load of values that guide you through life. Mm. You know, honesty and hard work and graft and humility. Um, so I think it definitely helps. But I, I think my, my grounding from my parents probably, you know, we it was always uh, impressed on me. That you have to give it everything you've got, whatever you do. So, I take parenting, but the values of, of rugby are shared to who I am. I would say. Yeah, that hard work, yeah. resilience, great everything that you absolutely. get. Absolutely, absolutely. I think resilience is another. It's a great word because 
not everything's going to go your way, you know, and you're going to, there's going to be setbacks and, you know, that, um, obviously the, the, the derby day a few, a few days ago, and there were players who will be waking up the things that they should have done, but you play again in five days time or whatever, so yeah. you've got to bounce back, you've got to be resilient, you've got to, um, you've got to be confident you can do it all again. The young Chris Radlinski, was he always a, a full-back, centre, three-quarter? No, no, I, I was uh, I was probably, when I first started, I was probably a loose forward. Um, and then I went to centre. But, I, you know, I was always a good defender. Um, and then uh, went, once I went back to full-back uh, academy days, I never really looked back after that. It, but it was probably defensive qualities, really, rather than anything else. And who did you want to be? Um... Well, I've, the the greatest that in in my eyes and probably most people's would be Ellery. You know, yes. Ellery was um, an absolute, an absolute god. But th there are other players around him. I love I love Joe Lydon. You know, Joe was an incredible defender. Um, I loved Hampo under that under the high ball. Um, and we, we were spoiled, weren't we, by these, these people oh. growing up? You know, the names that uh, in the town they were just iconic figures. So. If I was to say any, it would probably be them three. Yeah, yeah. Not three bad people, sir. To no, no, they're, they're, good, they're good, aren't they? They're good. Um, and now it's, it's crazy because now I get to call them my mates, which is mm. which is mad. Yeah, it's, it's, really it's mad. definitely a different feeling, that, isn't it? Getting to not only meet your heroes but work alongside them and actually play with them in some uh, some respect and, yeah, and get involved in the club. Yeah, you know, and I think um, for many, for many, there's loads of different reasons why we 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 we're trying really hard to. Get our past players program mm. back off the ground. Um, people who've run it are, are sadly not with us anymore, so we're driving it a lot ourselves. And uh, we've had some events. We had one with Fran Obotica a few weeks ago. Uh, and we, it was just on a Wednesday night. We just in, yeah. in Wayne's Bar here. We just had them down and just seeing all faces connecting. You know, there's a great image of Andy Gregg and, and Martin Dermott just stood at the bar with a pint of Guinness chatting. And it, it was like, you know, you you're actually part of a very special club here. Um, so we're going to try and do a lot more with, with these guys because, um, yeah, they, they, they've they've kind of built this 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 wonderful club, uh, and they're, we're all part of it. Definitely. Right, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk about your uh, your playing days. Yep. Thank you. So Chris, you you signed for the club and, and made your first team debut in 1993. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you, what was it like at the academy at that time? How was it get being around the club and almost everything before getting that first game? How how did you find that experience? Uh, it was an amazing experience. Um, we just a few weeks ago actually, when, um, Paul Stevens, who sadly passed away, um, we we all went to his funeral. Um, and it was an incredible turnout, but but who were actually there were, were people from my who were played in the academy with, and I'd not seen them for for many many years, and it it kind of promoted us conversations to get back you know get back talking and stuff like that. But I think that's what rugby does. It um it, it gives you friends for life. But it was an incredible it was an incredible uh, education for me. And then there was reserve grade then mm -hmm. the Alliance yeah. Team Rugby, and then, I don't know if you remember them days, but um, Thursday nights. You get three or four thousand people on at Central Park, mm. um, and this was this was days before salary cap, so people who weren't playing in the first team, they'd all play uh, reserve grade, and then the two the two best players from reserve grade would get would probably be on the bench for the, the first mm. team at the weekend. Incredible that how, how it used to work, but mm. yeah, you, if you were playing well, you would get brought off and you'd be on the bench for the first team. Um, this these days before salary cap, you know, we, we're gonna. Have, so many internationals playing in, in in the alliance, and people were turning up to watch. It. I think it was also used as a way of getting back into the team after injuries yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, we are, and you know, we have many many discussions here at our club about player pathways, and you know, the statistics tell you that rugby league is a, a late maturation sport. So we actually should be putting more effort into reserve grade rugby and more resources because that we need we need that as close as possible to to. To first grade rugby, but at the minute it's 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 not where it needs to be. So yeah. we've been working with with the RFL on pathways to, to kind of 
the, the academy will always be important, but it's the one the one below first grade that needs to be as close to it yeah. as possible. So we probably need to get back to, to the old central part there as well. In, talking about, obviously you mentioned academy, but talking about the reserve um, fixtures and the reserve um, games, there must have been some incredible characters and incredible mm. players that you come against, come up against in those days. Like you said, people come out from injuries, people that were just outside of first teams at Warrington and St. Helens and whatever. That in itself, from, from playing against players of a similar age, 17, 18, yeah. coming up against those guys in the primes or maybe even just past the primes who were still trying to make a living out of the game, it must have been an incredible experience. Oh, yeah, it was. It was. And like I said, you know, it, it attracted many, many uh, fans to, to the games and, and they were full on. You know, they were, they were, they were as close to, to first grade as, as it could be, but it was. You know, you talk about characters. I mean, you know, I, I always say that you can survive a rugby field, survive in the changing room. That's that's the biggest challenge yeah. you've got as a rugby player. You know, it's it's not for the it's not for the faint hearted. Um, but this, you know, this was this was before social media. It's probably before the internet. You know, when I look at, um, I guess the resources that the professionals have got now to to make themselves better, um, to, to go online to get menus to cook, look at recovery me- methods. All this kind of stuff. They've got everything they need now, and it's very. When I look back now, even though it was professional, it, it was nowhere near professional. Not, not compared to no one here. Yeah. No, because you know these guys are. It's our job to to create environments now where there is no excuses, uh, and the world's come a long way in a pretty short space of time. Mm-hmm. Use the term character building. Do you, do you feel as though those days from being to sixteen, seventeen through to making yourself a regular at maybe 19, those two years, was it very much so about building character as well as building yourself as a player? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, look. I Attitudes think, and... Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, as soon as you cross that white line to go on a rugby field, you have to take yourself to a completely different place. You know, it, it's, not a, it's not a sport that you can dip your toe in and, and take it easy. You just have to commit. So I think... Yeah, you, you have to do a lot of mental work before you even do it, you know. Um, and the work you do in the gym on your own, and uh, I always say when no one's watching, you know, that's where that's where it all builds character. Um, yeah, I think even now we, we can say that you know we've got some outstanding professionals, um, and these guys will be in probably <coughs> from eight this morning until you know probably three or four or something like that. It's what happens after four o'clock when they when they're having to make their own decisions. When they're having to, you know, decide what they're having for tea, when they decide whether they should stay in and go out and all this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. that, that's what makes great professionals. And you have to educate yourself early, to, to, you know, if if you wanna if you wanna commit to being a full time professional sportsman. You're a similar age to Fats <laughs> and um, Jason Robinson. Mm-hmm. Maybe just a, a touch all these up. I think it's well detailed how much um, Inga, Sugamala, um looked after Jason and, yep. and, and, and whatever. Did you have players in and around that time that you looked up to that maybe put an arm around you? Um, well, well, it was, um, you know, we, we used to train at the backfield at Central Park, uh, you know, behind the, behind the stand there. Um, and after training every day, I had to I had to stay behind with Jason Robinson and Inga, you know. That's why I had to defend against them two on my own, you know, like we do one-on-ones with each other. That was what I did every day. Now, when I think when I think back now, I'm thinking, you know, that, I mean, it must have been bloody hard. That, but what an education! Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, to, to, yeah. If, if you can defend against Stinger and Jason Robinson, you're doing okay. But well, I literally did it every single day. So, so them two, them two always made time for me, um, and I always got the the look at the end of training that I, I was staying back and doing a bit with them. Well, yeah. I just want to say on that, like, obviously, you're training up against two world-class players there one-on-one almost mm-hmm. did that give you an air of confidence when you came into into the first team right. that you defended against possibly two of the top yeah. 10 players yeah. in that position Abs- and- no absolutely yeah absolutely um that, that, you know i've no doubt that they were doing it for themselves but they, they were doing it for me as well mm. you know they were making me better um but when i think about it now like it's it, it was just incredible you know mm. when it, obviously inga I sadly passed away, and when you see, when you revisit and watch clips of him, mm. it's an absolute monster. Yeah. You know, I was tackling him every single day after training, you know, on my own, and then 
Jason standing you up and making you look stupid, and and, <laughs> and then but I'm learning so much from it. Yeah, hundred you know, percent. But you know, it, it beat me a few times. But you know, I get him and things like that. So it was, it was, it was always an environment of 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 um, making yourself better. So, so the, I always heard that Dennis Betts learned a lot from Andy Goodway coming through. Mm -hmm. He was always his arm around Dennis and, yeah. and showing him the way. And, and I, I think Andy gets Andy Goodway gets forgotten about. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, uh, when people talk about the greatest team, yeah. and greatest players, or whatever, Andy Goodway. Was one of the first professional players and, and, and what he brought to the club. Um, and I always talk about hearing that Sean Edwards was struggling defensively at one point, um, where um, he was struggling, you know, with confidence. I think he'd had that knock at Wembley and being open with the team about it and the team getting together and saying, look, it, 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 to make you be feel better and perform better is better for everybody. Um, that kind of culture where everybody's looking after each other and whatever is that something that you look for in a player when you bring him to a club much later I, I, we, we always got told at a sportsman's dinner that we had a, a, at our local club that willie i said you signed the best club man that, you, that you'll ever sign mm -hmm. and what he does is, is that something that you look at uh, i think yeah you it's it's a it's a whole round round view but you, you do it's got to be a balance of both i think you know you, you can you can you can build a great team spirit from people who do everything right, but but you need people who know how to play rugby as well. You, you know, I think uh, I think Willie's Willie's a great example of a professional and what he does for the um, for the kids and how he drives standards and how he is uh, a probably a major voice in many of the meetings. But if he wasn't bringing it on the field, he he, he wouldn't get selected. Mm. Um, so I think I think we definitely look for it, but you, but you need to have have the full full package and I think when you look when you you know recruit recruiting in a salary cap sport is, is is very very different and and I still don't think people understand it completely if I'm being honest it's uh I always say you can't you can't take a sign in in, in isolation you know you can't say why have you bought him well you don't know how much money I've got to spend you don't know you, you, you know you don't know how many yeah. positions you can play you don't know his injury history mm -hmm. you don't know the chemistry you can bring to the group you don't know how he'll become in the environment. So it's a massive jigsaw recruitment. Um, and it's it's probably the... You know, I, I, I like talking about it because it makes people, um, I guess, understand just how difficult it is, mm -hmm. really, because I think the only way people will understand it properly is, is if we do talk about it. So when we are recruited, we we, uh, we don't just look at the player. It's, it, it's probably four or five different conversations with many different people, um, building building pictures and, and um, again, again, I guess character assassinations to see you know, if it'll fit in our club. Um, so let's let's move on to, to your playing time as, it, as, a, as a whole. Obviously you, you made your debut in 93, away at Castleford off the bench. Mm -hmm. What was your experience of of that game? How did, how did you know you were playing, first of all? It, it was a day that was, a, it was an international Saturday I think England were playing France or something like that, um, and I was just, I was sat at home at that time. I probably trained with the first team twice, maybe, mm. um, and I was sat at home maybe six o'clock night before, um, and a couple of people got injured in the game, so John Dory phoned me up and you know said, "Yeah, you're in tomorrow," um, but I'd never I'd never travelled on a on a coach with or anything. Um, get on the coach the first day and. I, I sit in Andy Platt's place, which was not not the best move. So he gave me a look and I had to get up. And, um, but it was it was it was it was an incredible day, really. I mean, we actually got battered, but you know, it was it was the days when Morris used to come with the changing room just before and tell you how much you were getting paid for the for the game. That was all new to me, yeah. all this kind of stuff. But it was it probably worked well that I found out so late. Because I think if you find out early in the week, you're thinking about it all week. But I think because I found out when I did, you, you know, you, you just you just go into autopilot, really. And just you know. just get on with it, sort of attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, it, and it was, you know, it's a pretty non-eventful game mm -hmm. for, for me personally, and, and we got, we got battered, but it was, yeah, that was that was the first one. So then you you spent probably the next 18 months, a year, 18 months around the team and coming off the bench and 
deputised if there was a, a couple of injuries. I want to talk about, about a game that probably you could consider a, high, a, a highlight for yourself. Um, it was the Premiership final in 1995. Um, age 19, you scored a hat-trick against Leeds. You became the youngest person to ever score a hat-trick um, and the youngest ever to be awarded the Harry Sunderland Award for your performance in the match. Can you just tell us about your memories going into that game and, and actually what it was like performing and when you start to do well? Do you, do you, does that affect you that you notice you've had a good start to a game? And... Um, well, it, it, again, the, the reason I started that week was because um, Inga had to return home. Uh, he had a family member who died, so... Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a nice week in that respect because you know one of my mates had had to leave in unfortunate circumstances. But yeah, it's uh, you know the the defining games, aren't they? Um, I remember I, I scored pretty early on, and it kind of settled my nerves. Mm. And then I scored just before half time, and then in the changing rooms after uh, half time, Joel Lydon came to me and said, "No one's ever scored a hat trick." Mm. He said, "Just do whatever you can to score it." And we, you know, I think we pretty much won the game at half time anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a lot in front. Um, and then just after half time, uh, Henry Paul put a kick, kick down, kick down the right hand side, and I, and I got over. Um, and then about ten minutes after, Gary Connolly scored, yeah. scored, scored, scored the game the second. So um, I was going to say that 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 really surprises me because sometimes you would imagine people saying like, you just think about the team and 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 the personal the personal accolades almost. Go and miss, but there was talk of it at half time that you could be the first person to score a hat trick. Like, yeah. that really does amaze me as a as, as a fan. Well, I, I I mean, I, I probably probably the coach wouldn't have appreciated George's comments <laughs> uh, or, or many of the players, but you know, it's very vivid in my mind that he just came to me to do everything you can to get it. Um, and I, you know, I don't I, the way I am, I don't think I would have done anything that would have put us off off course as such, but. I think the fact that it, it was so early in the second half that I got it, it was kind of put it to bed. Um, and then Gary obviously got it a, a few minutes later. Um, but it, yeah, it was just it was one of them days that I could, you know, probably kick-started everything, really. Mm. Now, in that game you were you were awarded the Harry Sunderland Award. Mm -hmm. What was it like hearing your name announced at Wembley? At, at, at Old sorry, Trafford. At Old Trafford. That you'd won that and... Did you recognise the effect of that? Did you did you realise straight away what that meant for yourself? Or no, absolutely not, absolutely not. If I'm honest, I probably hadn't heard of it at the time. Mm. Um, when I when I sit back now and think about it, it was you know it was something I'm, I'm very very proud of, you know, to be on that list. But it, it, you just I don't I don't think in a in a sport like ours you think about things like that. Mm. It, you know, they just happen, but. Um, I remember. I remember exactly where I was on the pitch. You know when it was shouted out, um, and I remember seeing my dad in the crowd after, um, and all that kind of stuff. And, and it was a great day. And then what, what happened next was I got um, I got drugs tested, um, and I couldn't I couldn't leave. Couldn't get on the team coach. Uh, they went back to Wigan, and I had to stay at old. I couldn't, couldn't go to the toilet for must have been two or three hours. <laughs> um, and so I literally left in Old Trafford on my own and. The drug test that drove me back to Wigan, so very unglamorous. <laughs> and, uh, um, it's not really how you imagine the end of that game going. No, is it? not at all, not at all. Some drinking champagne or something, <laughs> but it was. Uh, yeah, I sat with a, 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 a. To be fair, this bloke did an amazing job driving me home. Um, he didn't need to do that, but and then I caught up with the rest of the team and celebrated. But it was. Yeah, it's little things like that. But I'm interested to know why your dad didn't stay behind. <laughs> well, yeah. Or was he off celebrating? He, he, he was probably drunk at that point, yeah. Um, no, but it was... I like little stories, little things like that, mm. that people don't know about behind, behind, the, behind the scenes. But, uh, yeah, it was you know, incredible there for me. Did, um, sorry to jump in there. Did any... Obviously, only 19 at that time when that happens. Was there then kind of any, I don't know, I suppose, like added pressure? Kind of going into that, that like you've had this really good performance in the Premiership final, a bit of a spotlight on you. Did that kind of add anything, or was it just a case of no go again? You know, in the well, time well, do that. Like pretty much, know? pretty much straight after the game, I got an international call up. Really, right. so that, that that was nowhere near on my radar. So that right. came pretty quickly. Um, but then, 
Yeah, I think there was probably no 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 turning back from that point. I didn't no. I didn't, I didn't p- feel pressure as such. I think it was, okay. you know, once you get a taste of something, it's you, you don't you don't sit down and relax. You roll your sleeves up and, and it starts again. So no, I, I never felt pressure. I was I knew I was in a great place. I knew I was at a, you know an amazing club. Um, was there a time that you that you remember thinking to yourself, I'm going from being a let's say, a standing player, a player that was a young up-and-coming player, to being an actual first-teamer, you know, and you thought, that's my spot, I'm, 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 I'm in there now, people are going to have to take this shirt off me. Uh, it, was, it was probably, it might have been two, two or three years after, after, after the Premiership final, you, you have to realise that, you know, this team it was just full of superstars. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I, th- I think I appreciate it from, from <laughs> yeah. being a fan of the, of that time. Maybe maybe the younger guys don't remember it, but understanding that really, in my opinion, it was more like ninety seven, yeah. as opposed to it being ninety five and ninety six. Yeah, well, well ninety six was at um, Middlesex Sevens. Um, you know, I played in the games, but you know, the people who were in that team around me, you know. Jason, Henry Paul, Gary Connolly, Martin Affair, Martin Fadley, Andy Fadley, Fadley. Fadley. Just, just it's ridiculous. Scott Cunnell, uh, you know, it's incredible. So I, I knew, it, you know, even though I weren't in, I knew I was in the right place because I was going to get better, and my time would come. Um, and, it, and, it, and it, you know, and it, and it did. Um, but again, I go back to the school and the like. Yeah, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you couldn't fail, but when you're working with these players every single day, you've got a hell of a chance. Yeah. Hell of a chance. So I, I want to talk about another Premiership final that you had quite uh, quite close after. A win against St. Helens, 44-14. Mm-hmm. Did it feel any different winning, winning it a second time, if that makes sense? Was, was it at that point then that you were expected to win things at Wigan or did it feel better because it was the old enemy sort of situation? Um... Look, I really, I really respect the rivalry of St Helens. I think, um, I think it's an incredible thing for our sport. I think it's an incredible thing for British sport. You know that what we've got um, just a few miles separating us in, in games that never ever disappoint. Mm. Uh, so I, I think any victory against Saints is a very, very special one. You don't take that for granted. Um, but I guess, I guess it, it was obviously. Another win at Old Trafford. Um, I was more established um, in the team at that point, and I was playing with, you know, mates who were still my best mates now. So it was it was a good time. It was a good time. Now, obviously, the change to Super League happened, mm-hmm. and nineteen ninety eight, probably, it w- it was a massive year for yourself. Um, you was named in the Super League dream team. Um, you would be involved in the grand final victory against Leeds. How special was that moment and that year for you for yourself? Did did that really feel like I've made it now and I'm I'm, I'm in this team and it's it's my spot sort of situation? It was a good year. It was a big year. Obviously, it was the first time we'd gone through the um, uh, on the new Super League trophy. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time we, you know, you got grand final rings and things like that. It felt very very different. Um, I was involved in the the. I was going to say the Super League war, but the the breakaway things that that happened were, you know, everybody everybody got money to stay in the competition and things like that. It was a, it was a very very special time, and it felt like a big a turning point for the sport the whole season. Um, so it, it, what I remember about the game, not pouring down, you know, a piece of magic from Jason that got it. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew Farrell kicked us to victory. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very very intense game. Not 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 too similar to last Friday's yeah, game. It, it, the defenses were on it, top. You know, it was mad, and, and and I always talk about it with Matt now. Is that grand final weather is is raining? You know, Leeds won so many without actually playing much rugby. They just mm. they, they were so tough in the middle, and, and Kevin Sinfield, you know, um, kicked the ball all over the field, and that's what you have to do in, in grand finals and final rugby in October. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you're not going to see spectacular tries at that time. So, it's an interesting one, really, when you're recruiting. You, you know, we obviously got some pretty, pretty flat, fast, talented players now, but but you want people who who you can do it when it's a cold, not cold day in mm-hmm. October in Manchester, because that's when they're giving out the prizes. Uh, that's when it matters, isn't it? And, and it's. Did did you realise that that was 
the situation, obviously that was the first Super League. Was it built up to be the event that it was now for yourself? Did, did you know the importance of winning that that final? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it it, it was like a, like I said. I think it, it felt like a very very big time for the sport. Um, you know, sell out. Um, it we were getting more coverage on TV, uh, and to, to win it, you know, the first time was 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 really special for us all, and it mm-hmm. felt like a a real momentum shift mm-hmm. for the sport. So it was. It was an important time for the for the game. Now, after that, you'd, you'd end up being involved in, in three grand final losses mm-hmm. uh, in 2000, 2001 and 2003. Was there anything that, that you look at that you think could have been done differently or something that stands out that you think maybe if if would have cha- maybe trained differently? I, I, I don't know. Is there something that you look back with a little bit of... Well, well I'm, I'm going to bring something up here now. You switched... Um... In the 2000 final, you switched to centre mm-hmm. and Jason went to full back. Mm-hmm. Um, was that something that was planned all week or, or, or was that... You're testing my memory, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm only going to say it because we were walking down from the railway club and the team news yeah. come out and it was like, Robinson's playing full back, Raz yeah. is playing centre. And I think it was all around Gary Conley got injured yeah. Yeah, and yeah. missed the final and I think they were a little bit worried about... New love and, and, yeah, and whatever. Do, 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 do you know the other thing that happened at the time as well is that we, you know, the game had gone full time professional. Yeah. So, so, you know, when when Wigan were when I was first starting, there, there was only us probably full time. Mm. So every other club had got had got better, and we'd gone through that period where we was expected to win everything. But now, but clubs were doing things differently. You know, and they were investing in. In facilities, we were investing in full time staff and full time players and things. So, it, it was almost it was becoming a different competition. So, yeah. um, although we'd we'd say we'd love to have won all them finals, yeah, you have to say that the environment was very very different. We were up against far better far better teams than we we have done in the past. Right, mm. that's really interesting to think about. That like. You were almost. Well, you were aware of that at the time, or was that something? I know you you could, you could sense it. It was getting better. The, the 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 competition was getting better. You could you could definitely sense it. The emergence of St Helens, first of all, and then the Bradford, the big yeah, Bradford yeah. team. Um, they, I mean, they'll they'll go down as, as some of the greatest teams those clubs have ever had. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very much so. Um, and people forget that. As people forget it. You know, mm. it was a, it was a crucial time for the sport. You know, we 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 were playing against. Against people who have full time jobs at the, at some at some yeah. points, uh, but now they were dedicating everything to to a proper professional environment, which mean which meant that the competitions got stronger and better. Yeah. So for the for the the, the entirety of the league, it was better that they'd improved, but obviously yeah. disappointing to be involved in. Them oh yeah, three it, it, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, I'd love to love to win all, them all, mm. but but I'm also quite. I've always been quite balanced on things, and I understand that. Um, you know, winning and, and losing the part of professional sport. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think I, I even now I don't get I don't get too carried away. You know, triumph and disaster, all that money. I'm only a phone call away from something going very very wrong, and that's yeah. what you know. I'm always pretty level on things like that, and I accept. I think it's important to lose at times, not in cup finals. Mm. But I think it's important to lose to to find out about your group and your journey and things. It was interesting last semi final um, when Sam Tompkins mm-hmm. scored last minute and you know to get to the grand final for yeah. us and James there was that Catalan on and all the French fans come onto the field and James Robey in his final game has been interviewed and he had the class that said you know actually this might be good for rugby league yeah. it seemed that was probably a similar thing with those three finals where yeah, actually you're right you know <clears throat> we don't want to lose never want to lose but actually seeing that other people other clubs are going professional the standards increasing the, it's good for the sport it's good yeah, for the competition yeah, yeah I think I, look, I, I I understand this town. I know how demanding it is, and I know how much we want to win. Um, and it, you, you know, I, I get it completely. But we also, I don't think we want to turn up every week wanting to win forty and fifty points every single week. And that, that's that's no good for anybody. That 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 turns people off the sport rather than creating the excitement of a, what happened on Friday. You know, it was. I can take I can take a philosoph- philosophical view over that game and said, if we keep if the standard of the sport keeps providing things like that, then the health of the sport will be better for, will, for, for a long time. It's surely got to be better. I remember we've chatted on this podcast before about, you know, things like 
mostly last season because last season did just seem like the most competitive there, you know, maybe a couple of teams. But I remember when I first got into rugby league, no disrespect to these but your teams like your Salford, your whole KRs, if Wigan were go playing in the same, you would you was expecting two yeah. points. Like whereas now you go and you're like, you know, it's not gonna be easy this, is yeah. it? You know, and but that it does increase standards, doesn't it? That competition does and it, it's it is good, isn't it? For yeah, you? and I guess I guess in my role now it, it, it is the health of the sport as well that I need to look after, not yeah. just the health of this club and I, and I, you know, I think you're right, last season's competition nobody, you know, predicting results was harder yeah. than it's ever been. Yeah. Um so I think in order to keep driving the quality, which means we'll get broadcasters interested and mm. excited. and Sky Sports showing every game this yeah, season, more to, competitive, close games. Hopefully to, to invest more. Mm. You know? And that's that's what, you know, that's... I, I, I get I get this turn and I guess I get Wigan has wanted to win and we'll try our hardest to win every single game, but I just don't think we can... I think the holy grail for any sports club is to, is to win... Um, but if you lose, to still have your supporters there with you uh, on on the journey, um, yeah. and, and I think I think that's where we are at the minute. Now, we're gonna we're gonna jump to a final, um, and it's your name gets brought up every time this final is mentioned. Two thousand and two Murrayfield, the Challenge Cup final. Yeah. Wigan win twenty one twelve. Yeah. Uh, twenty one twelve, yeah, against Saint Helens. But it was an interesting week for yourself. Um, Four days in hospital with a, 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 an infection, and it must have been a surreal week for you. That from being in hospital to winning the um, Lance, Todd. Lance Todd Trophy and mm-hmm. winning twenty one twelve. I, I, I want to start before the game. At what point did you know you were playing? Like, um, I, I woke up. I woke up uh, in the hotel room and. It's crazy, crazy when you think about it. I, uh, when you go in the hotel rooms, you have you have these things what you put suitcases yeah. on. Um, I put it on the bed, and I had my foot elevated all night. Literally didn't move, uh, and I looked at my foot in the morning, and it was it was all gone. Mm. But then I stood down, and went for a shower, and everything rushed to my foot. My foot just went massive. Um, so then I went. I just went there to breakfast, um, and Doctor Zaman was was in having breakfast, and he calmly uh, finished his breakfast, and he said, right, "Come to my room." And there was a few bloodthirsty individuals who who followed um, Terry Newton and, and Andrew Farrell, and, and Craig Smith was there at the time as well. And uh, we, yeah, we we went to the doctor's room, and um, I think I think I think Terry videoed it or something like that. But the doctor sliced open the top of my foot. Uh, and everything just like, gushed out everywhere. And then I went, uh, they, they packed it. He, he said, I can't stitch it up because it will refill. So he just put some packing in there. And then he took me down to the gym. Uh, and Stuart Raper was the coach and he got me to run on the treadmill. So I ran three or four minutes and he looked at me and said, what do you want to do? I said, right, yeah, I think I'm okay. So he said, right, trust you. And that was it. Um, and then the kit man at the time and my boot didn't fit me so he brought one bigger so I had, had one boot bigger than the other in the game and it's just mad mad mm. when you think about it and then the game obviously we, we went in as underdogs yeah. um, and then just things just kept happening in the game that went went for me mm. and just one of them you know sports full of these stories and, and uh, back, back stories that create the ultimate the ultimate finale and that was one of them it was Crazy week. Still don't. Still can't get. To, oh, I'm not bothered anymore. But still don't know what it was. Um, but it, it, it it's probably the one thing people talk talk to me about every single week. It was it was a magical moment again against So you still don't don't know what was up. And it was some kind of infection. But uh, it, you know, it was it was it an insect bite or something? I don't know. I don't know. I was just I was I was walking around Trafford Centre, uh, and I had to sit down. I said something's not right. So I phoned the doctor, and by the time I got to Wigan, he, he, met, he was at my house waiting for me. And then he took me straight to hospital, and then I was in for four days. Really? I'd... But but it was it like, yeah, you know, players would come and visit me, and you know, all this kind of stuff, and I was getting get well cards. And I remember I was writing in these get well cards notes on all St. Helens players and things like this <laughs> in the cards, because um, I just wanted to prepare myself. You know, mentally, as if I was playing, 
and then I, I travelled up. Oh, the team came to the ho to the hospital in the team coach, and I got on the got on the courts there. It sh shouldn't have happened really, but it was crazy. Mm. crazy. Well, you had a massive performance in that game. Yeah, three try saving tackles. <laughs> was there a moment where you realised like? When you make one of them tackles to, to obviously stop Tim Yonkers twice and, and Cunningham once, do you realise how big they are at the time, them tackles? Or or was it a bit of after the game you went, oh, that, to be fair, that was a pretty good tackle and I've, I've, I've saved us there? No, I think you, you're aware of what you're doing. But it, I think when you watch it back, you know, there's loads of things that happened in that game. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was an incident after about 10 minutes where uh, Lamy put a kick through and I was chasing it and Longy ran me off the ball and nearly scored but as I did it I, I headbutt the, the ground and I'm literally I blacked out for a minute um, mm. and then but then you, you, you're back into it and um, and then things go for you you know mm. like I've, I've played loads of games and I've made tackles and where they fell over the line you know the one with Tim Yonkers where he dropped the ball on the line I, I could probably do that 10 or 15 times again and he wouldn't drop the ball it was just it was, I just think it was somebody up there was perhaps looking looking out for me that day um, now, now in that game was was there any moment where you felt that moment of relief that you'd won it or was it just at the hooters obviously you, you, you're carrying that injury <clears throat> was there a moment of relaxation where you went actually we've won this and you can celebrate it or, yeah that I, make sense? It, it, was, it was weird because I, I don't, still don't know why they do it, but they they announced they announced they like the lads told you that ten it's, minutes. Yeah, what's that? Seven eight minutes before, don't yeah, they? Yeah, and the game. So, they must, so actually, they announced it seven eight minutes before. They must be collecting the votes. Yeah, five ten minutes exactly. before that. So, but yeah. but there was the game still wasn't won then. I, no. mean, I think we got a penalty late on for fans to kick it. But when 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 they announced the Lance Todd, I'm pretty sure there was only a try in it, mm. um, which was crazy really. But I think after the game, it's my favourite time of the week just straight after a game because it, you know yeah it's about peaks and troughs and that that moment after a game you can just relax you sit with your mates and it's probably probably an hour or so before you can before the next journey starts mm. again so I sat there and I weren't like buzzing I was just I just kind of took it all in really mm. um, but but it, you know it's a man magical day it, um, Challenge Cup final against Saints, and you win Lance Todd. Mm. You know, uh, it's just stuff you dream of. Yeah. And it, things happened, went for me that day. Lammy was outstanding that day. Um, and again, what was really special for me about that time was I was with some of my best mates I've, you know, mm. I've, I've, I've ever had in my life, and we'd all done so much together. I was going to say, you just mentioned it then, that they're the moments as a kid that you're playing on a field, you, you make a tackle, you score a try. Uh, uh, at Murrayfield, at Wembley, at Old Trafford, that that's your, almost a dream come true that you have a performance like that in such a big final, um, and it puts all them years of hard work that that you obviously did mm. into, and sacrifices, in, in, yeah, 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 into perspective. And after the game, do you almost have a think about all the all the what it's took to get you to to that point? I've always, I'm all. I've, I'm a bit deep anyway, so I always, I'd always quite reflective and quite think about your journey, and then think about people who, who've helped you to get there. So I would say that I, I probably spent some time just thinking about it, um, and I knew, I knew, you know, like you said, it, it's the stuff you dream of as a kid. So I, I knew to win the Lance Todd against Saints in a Challenge Cup final. I, you know, I knew it was pretty special, mm. um, and it, it's, it's the one that like I said people, people still talk to me about it. Yeah. So. It's good. So, I just want to go towards the end of end of your career. Yeah. March two thousand and six, you you announced your retirement. Yeah. From the game due to it quite prematurely. Yeah. Mid at the start of the season, due to some persistent injuries. How did how did you come to that decision? Was it was it something that was quite quite simple and you knew it was the time or? No. Well, I I, I, I had two. I've still got them, two stress fractures uh, in my back. and um, So I wasn't doing enough training. Mm. I wasn't sleeping proper. Um, and when I was coming in, I was I was going into games un underprepared and you were picking up other injuries. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 this is not a sport you can, you can take easy. If you're, mm. not, if you're not physically and mentally prepared, 
and rest it up, then you can't do it justice. You can't do it justice. So, so, so you you knew that that was probably yeah, was, your it, time, and, and yeah. it had had its toll on you. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. You know, it, sorry, was it was it an easy thing to accept that? Oh, was it quite? Uh, I know sometimes people dream about like retirement, going out on, and just have some time to do it preacher because of injuries. Was it easy to accept, or was it? No, no, no. It was it was tough because uh, it, our sport's very very different to any other. You know, you every single person who. who who plays rugby knows that they have to reinvent themselves after after the career's finished yeah. to do another job. Mm. So it, it was that uncertainty that I st- didn't know what I wanted to do. It was a very difficult time, um, mm. but it, there's just an acceptance that if you can't do it no more, you can't do it. Yeah. So you know there was times where I still get, I was still getting picked, but my body just wasn't wasn't strong enough, you know, because I, I weren't doing the enough training to to get to it. But I suppose as a professional, you're saying that you know you just know that it's going to happen at some point you must live with that whether you're an, a 19 year old or whether you're a, a, a 31 year old you know that you, you're one broken leg you're one injury away from from possibly never playing again or whatever so you, you've got to live with that but you have to live with it and, and don't get me wrong you you get paid you get mm. paid for that and so i understand it completely um but every single every single rugby league player who, who, who takes the field is putting the Putting the body at risk, you know, it's not an easy, not an easy sport. Um, and I always, I always kind of think to myself when I'm at games, uh, and I, listen, I understand passionate support, and I, it, it, that's what sports for. But when when you hear and see some of the comments, and you're just like, you, people have not clue what these guys yeah. put their bodies through, you mm-hmm. know, for our entertainment. Um, but it, it's it's we make them choices, don't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, we make them choices. Um, no, it was only. Yeah, I find that really interesting. Obviously, with the injuries that you had and whatever, that in June you you came out of retirement to to play six or seven games, six games, I think it was. Yeah. Was that because of your love for the club? Or I think it was a unique set of circumstances. Yeah, it was. It it, it was different. You know, I I'd, I'd, I'd had a period of rest, mm. so I, I was in a I was in a better place. I was in communications with people at the club, and, and it, you know. I could see, I could see, and hear the noises mm. coming and the threats, and you're going lower and lower. And I know, I know professional sport. And when when you're in in these situations, that there's a couple of clubs in at the moment. You know, noises get louder, and yeah. and people go into the shells. And it was a young team, and it just it, it was probably lacking leaders at that time. Mm. Um, so I, I had a conversation with Brian Noble at the time, and I said, listen. I'm not going to bring you loads, you know, from a technical rugby point of view, but I can be a confident voice for you in the changing rooms if you want. Um, we had a, a few conversations, and then, you know, Morris, Morris, gave me a call, and then, I, and then I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come back. But I, it was, you know, in them in them games, I don't think I particularly did anything good, but I, I was probably the loudest in the changing room and, and give a bit of confidence at that time. So. Because I always imagine it as either you approached the club and offered your services, or or they asked you to come out of retirement. But it, by the sounds of it, it was a mix of both. Yeah, and... I was I, because I was still in contact with people, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I, I um, Brian Noble sent me a few texts, and I, I'd mm-hmm. send him a few thoughts on a few things, and then I, I, I think I was I, I was actually driving down to um, I was actually driving down to London to to meet Andrew Farrell. Uh, I was going to a concert or something. Uh, and then I got got a phone call, and they just they just listen. Can you come and do a job for us? I said, yeah, I'll try. Mm. So it's interesting that point about being the voice in the changing room as well, because I suppose I don't know from my point of view. I'd say that's probably one thing that you can't really coach into a player. They've either got that leadership, that voice. There's just some people when you're in changing rooms, they speak and you listen. Mm-hmm. And there's others who will perform amazing on the pitch, absolutely smash people in tackles and then you'll go, do you know what, it's one of the quietest lives I've ever met. You know, there's just everybody's different. Yeah, like yeah there's, lot, there's, there's, there's loads. You know, I, we, we, we've obviously got Bevan here and, and people wouldn't, people see Bevan as this cool guy, you know, winks at people. And he probably mm. one of the most educated voices in the changing room. Mm. And when you see him speak after the game like he did on Friday, People would be surprised by, by that. Um, but no, I've, I've always again. I go back to the education. I've, I've had some, you know, I've had, spent my career with Andrew Farrell. You know, I've spent my career with Sean Edwards. You know, these people have 
of educating me to, to such a, a place where, you know, I know, I know what I'm saying, I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm not afraid to, to, to give your opinion, so. You've been there, done it, and you know what those situations need. Absolutely. I mean, you, you mentioned it being a young team. It, it was a young team, but but even the age that we had in the team were new players to the club as well. The, you know, we'd lost Terry O'Connor, we'd lost Faz, we'd lost a lot of, uh, we'd, I think we'd lost Terry Newton. Um, we'd lost a lot of Wigan DNA yeah, around that yeah, time. I'd, yeah, and, I'd, and I'd, I'd, I'd spoke, I've spoken many times about, I felt, I felt that it, the the culture that we had had eroded and it wasn't what it needs to be. Um, and I guess it was just, you know, listen, I'm, I'm not going, I wasn't going in the, um, you know, saying things like rocket science or anything like that. It was just, it was just rugby league talk. Yeah. Confidence. Listen, lads, you know, we, let's, get, let's get ourselves together. No. Obviously, you, you you retired after them six games. Was there a temptation to carry on, or no? Or did you know no, you were done? No, no, I knew, I knew. Like I said, I've got too much respect for the game. Mm. You know, too much respect for the game. It, it's 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 a young man's game, and it's mm. all it's a it's an athlete's game. And when you're not an athlete, and when you're not committed, and when you can't you know, take your body to places anymore, then it, it's time to give it up. So, mm. listen, there's no regrets. Yeah, you know, I'd have liked it to have gone longer, but. If you'd have said to me right at the start, I'd have played over 300, I'd, I'd have snapped your hand off. So um, every player's going to have to go through with it. We do a lot more with our players now to, to prepare them for these things. Yeah. Um, so I'll use what I've yeah. learned to, to, to implement to, to these guys. Right. Before before we wrap up this section, I think it would be unfair to not mention your, your international career. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you played just uh, about 30 games for England and, and Great Britain combined. You were involved in the '95 uh, World Cup final. Um, that was a defeat to Australia. Can you can you talk us through what it was like? Was that was that almost the next level of I don't know excitement before the game? Like obviously playing grand finals, premierships, but to play a World Cup final against Australia. Yeah, that was. Uh, I mean, uh, Diana Ross was the bloody warm up act. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, packed out Wembley. It was that was as big as it big, big as it can be. So. Um, yeah, playing in a World Cup for your for your country uh, is something I'm incredibly proud of. I love playing for England. Love playing for 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 GB. I think it, I think it might have been 2002. Where yeah, we the three games. The three games we lost <laughs> by six points. I think it's, I think it's the closest we've been. It, it was six four and six or something oh, like that, was, wasn't it, it? It was mad, you know. Um, Dan Lockyer was at his best, uh, but we were close. Every game was a thriller. And I don't think we've been as close since, if I'm no. being honest. No. Um, but we, but you lose three 0 in an Ashes series, but it, it it could have been so different. Um, every one of them games was an absolute blinder. I do think looking back, that era of that early two thousands, two thousand and one, two, three. I'm not using the term Alcyon days, but to a lot of fans, that was almost like the pinnacle of intensity and yeah. and excitement. It, but probably a bit a bit of the old style rugby mixed in with the more professional attitude. Well, I think I think one of the games as well. One of the games definitely I, I played in was Moz got sent off after eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and we lost. We had six points. And we went like the whole game, the twelve men. But the, it was it was magical. It was a good time. Mm. It was a good time to be an international player. And tour to tour with some of the greats, you know, immortals. They they call them absolutely, Australia absolutely. Just... Yeah, you know, they were. Um, they knew they'd been in a series as mm. well, uh, and I've heard people talk about it since. That, you know, their their favourite ever Test series, but we was close. But T <laughs> three talking, nil. Talking about playing playing them, did you? Was there ever a bit of you were in all all of that side? They, they, they were a brilliant side, and some of the names that you see were, were greats of the game. World Cup finals, these Ashes series. Was there ever a moment where you thought, "One, I've made it, but I can't, I can't live on playing up against some of these." Yeah, look, look, I think from a professional sportsman, you're not wired mm. that way to be. You know, you know, mm. you're aware of how good they are, and you're aware you're playing against one of the best teams, best teams ever. But I wouldn't say you were. I wouldn't say it was fear. I would just say, it, you know, I think I think the mentality of, of professional sportsman is whoever you're going to, coming up against, you, you you know, you can have a you can have a good crack at. It focuses them. you. He's got to, he's got to focus you. Have, you. you have to because if you're not switched on, you're not, not in this sport. You can't. If you went in in awe, then this sport would, would rip you to shreds. You know, so 
and that's not that's not arrogant or anything like that. That's just saying that's the way that you a kind of professional sportsman's mind works. Mm. Although you had defeats in, in in the World Cup final in in ninety five, and then you talk about that Test series, etc. Um, how do you view those compared to like the wins? Are they are they, are they still like you class them as like the pinnacle of some of the the best? Yeah, like like it, I've just talk, spoke about that test series. I, I, I'm ridiculously proud of that test series, even though we lost three 0 because I knew just how good it was. Mm. Um, and I've always had that ability, you know. If if you think, I think back to twenty twenty, um, or twenty twenty two, whatever it was, I can't remember uh, the COVID. Grand final, yeah, at, you know, at, yeah. at, at Hull there, and and Jack Wells, we did what he did at the end. I knew in that moment that yeah, we just lost the grand final, but that was an epic, mm. epic mm. rugby match. You know, I've always had that, I guess that all that over overriding view about the health a privilege of the game. to be part of. Absolutely, it. you know, I sat, I, you know, I spoke in the changing rooms after. I don't usually do that. I spoke to the team after about what 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 I just witnessed. Mm. Uh, you know. How, how competitive it was, how thrilling it was. And people at home must have been absolutely blown away by it. And mm. fortunately, you know, I, I praise Jack Wellsby. You know, he had the courage to... That little one percenter. Courage. Mm. He, had, he had no right to chase that ball. But he did it. And in that, that late stage of the game, and again, sport does things like that if you, if you, if you have the courage to do things differently. And he did it. But I, straight after the game, I was like, yeah, we're going to be OK as... Mm. as a club and as a sport because that was outstanding right we'll take a quick break though and then we'll come back and talk about your uh, post retirement uh, time cool so Chris obviously that wasn't the end of your involvement in rugby league some people Finish the career and 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 leave the sport behind. Mm-hmm. You you was very quickly involved. Two thousand and nine, you uh, became one of the the scholarship coaches mm-hmm. at Wigan. Had you always planned on getting involved in coaching post retirement, or was it just an opportunity for you? No, no, not a clue what I wanted to do. Um, when I finished, I um, I went to Australia. I spent a bit of time over there. Brian Kearney was over there mm-hmm. at the time. Spent a bit of time with him. Um, Came back, still not clear what I wanted to do, um, and then I, 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 Joe Lydon was here at the time, uh, and I had a meeting with Joe Lydon, and, and Joe said, you know, do you want to get back involved? So I came down and just threw my hat into the ring, really, did a little bit, mm. enjoyed it, you know, rugby league's all I've ever done. So, but I, I was, I was very conscious I never wanted to be a coach, mm. and the reason I didn't want to be a coach is because it, it's a bit too all-consuming and takes over your life. Um, so as you can imagine what I'm doing now is, you know... <laughs> and you consider that yeah, all-consuming. I, yeah, I, I don't know how that works. But no, it was, it was just a... Uh, I, came, I, got, you know, I came back, enjoyed it, um, and then Mr Lennigan, obviously, um, I had a meeting with Mr Lennigan. A couple of years earlier, Ian owned uh, the London Broncos, uh, and he tried to get me to go and, 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 and play for them, um, but I didn't. But we kept in contact, and um, he he got me down to his office and said, listen, do you, wanna, do you want a job? And I said, doing what? He said, don't know yet, we'll figure it out. Uh, and then every single year, I just got more and more responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and then probably, it was probably, probably maybe six or seven years ago that Ian said that you will be chief exec when I think you're ready. Mm. So ever since that, he's just given me more and more things, more so, responsibilities. So do you think Ian recognised your qualities and, and and your understanding as that role? And he, he, not knowing how to get you into it, but he saw that that was a potential... He's always felt like he's been a mentor to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he's, all, he's always said all along he, like, he likes the mentality of professional sportsmen. Mm. Because of work ethic, so he's employed many, many different roles. Um, but yeah, from a from a from a very early, early stage, uh, when Michael Maguire came, um, and and obviously when he was assistant coach, we we would spend a lot of time and it just just giving me more and more things to do, a little mm. bit more challenging, and then 
Um, I take myself away and do different courses and different things like that to, to educate myself. Um, and, you, you know, just just work your way up. See, that, that that's really bad that you, you weren't just thrown in, thrown in at the deep end. Well, and I, I think it shows, that, personally, a, a bit of astuteness on, on, on Ian's part that I think back in the old days, people used to take rugby players and put them in charge without the life skills and even into coaching mm-hmm. in, without the life skills you know you're a great player so you'll be a great coach yeah. um, you're a great player so we'll put you at the head of the club or chairman or, or whatever yeah. without any, any skills yeah. uh, in business but Ian's obviously spent somewhere between five and ten years almost you know educating you and almost like an apprentice to him 100% I, I 100% like, you know we we probably spoke every day for the last decade and, and during that time is is giving me things to do, giving me more responsibilities. Um and, you know, I worked hard. You yeah. know, absolutely what the last thing I would want is for people to think that I've just been given this job. You know, it's a token thing. If that if that ever if I ever get that sense of anything then I'll I'll just quit it really because yeah. that's 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 not what I'm about and I know it's I know it's not the case because I know what I've been through to get here. Um, you know, you guys have arrived today here and you've walked in the facility and you see, you know, how it's developed and everything. Literally every single thing you see on the wall or, or the gym or anything, you know, I've done that. Mm. You know, I've, I've literally, um, I've literally created this place with just my imagination and, um, you know, working with sponsors, signing but, players, but, working the community. But know. it would be fair to say... You didn't do that on day one. No, hundred percent. No, it, it, it no. took five, like we said, five to ten years yeah. to actually have mm-hmm. the uh, the experience, uh, the knowledge on how to implement that vision. Yeah, you, oh, didn't, you, you didn't do it on day no, one. No, 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 no. And uh, you know, I came in. I was um, Michael Maguire in in Australia. They had a thing called uh, football manager. So it was Madge's job to to get the wins at the uh, the weekend. Football manager's job to say. Okay, what we're doing in two weeks, what we're doing in a month, who we're playing, how we're traveling, you know, who's at a contract, and I'd do all that stuff. Um, so, you know, I own Michael Maguire a lot uh, as well uh, in, in that respect. But, you know, Ian, Ian undoubtedly changed the trajectory of my life, you know, by giving me opportunities and exposing me to situations that, you know, there are times when I've, I've you know, I've pinched myself and just said, you know, how the hell's that happened? You know, that I'm in this, I'm in these places, um, but it's all because of, it's all because of the opportunity, but it's also because of what. And we, and we forget, relatively at a young age as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you weren't coming into this in your fifties, um, where you'd had twenty years of experience, or yeah. thirty years of experience, where you where you generally get promoted into management in a normal business yeah. or whatever. You, you, you were still in your early 30s and... No, and, and the other thing about this job as well is that it, it it's not for the faint-hearted, this, mm. you know. <laughs> there's there's a lot easier jobs, trust me. Um, this is probably the hardest job in, in, in rugby league in this yeah. country because it's such a demanding time because our history has, has mm. provided this backdrop that we've got to try and replicate. Yeah. Uh, and they always want somebody to blame. Mm. Uh, so... It's took skills to do the job, but also the strength of character, and that you know, I um, I consider I consider myself a pretty a pretty strong guy uh, who have difficult conversations, um, and I needed to to show that as well to prove what I, what I can do. Now it's interesting. Before we come on recording this podcast, you said to us we've just spent you know however long we've just spent there in those last two segments talking about your playing careers, but you openly said to us, look. When my time comes at Wigan, I'm going to probably remember the stuff I've done in this role now than my playing days. It's, it's this bit now. 100%. Been, but, uh, 100%. Yeah. I'll leave here one day. What I've done in the last 10 years, I'm more proud of than putting a jersey on. Because it, it's, it's things that people that know, know. You know, people yeah. within this organisation know. Um, people know the things I do, the ideas I have. Um, but you've, you've had to reinvent yourself. You've had to work yeah. hard to reinvent yourself. And I do. I do. Ninety, hundred hours a week on this rugby club, and I, you know, I, again we spoke earlier. People see eighty minutes of that, eighty mm. minutes of that week, but the um, for many reasons, I can't, I can't tell people all the information I mm. know. But if everyone 
had the information that I have, we'd all make the same decisions. Yeah. Yeah. We, we would. You know, we would. It's not rocket science, we believe, but I, I can't come out and say everything because that's not how... And, and, and having the strength of character to carry on making those decisions, knowing what you know behind the scenes without the average Joe, yeah. ourselves, fans, knowing that information. And it might look like a 50-50 call, but actually... It's the right thing to do. You well, have to do ev- these things. Ev- everything is the everything is the right decision. I've, I've no doubt about that. And th- you know there are there are different there are differing opinions on whether we should sign in, whether we should do that, whether we should change the badge, all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. But if if you weigh everything up, it's it's the right decision, mm-hmm. and it's not just me making these decisions. Yeah, I've 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 spoke to people here. I've spoke to coaches. I've spoke to players. I've spoke to staff. I spoke to chairman. You know. And it's my job as a face of it to deliver it, but it, you know not everybody can do that. Um, not every, it, it, I guess it's a frustration, but it, it, it's just part of the job. And mm. as with experience, I've come to, I've come to understand that um, as long as as long as people who I report to know, then. Mm. But it, earlier on, you you, you talked about um, just a few seconds ago. You, you you talked about being proud. You know. Very proud of, of of what you've done since your playing career, possibly slightly more than, than your playing career. But coaches have to deal with that as well. The coaches are looking at what they've done rather than an individual as a player. There is only so much effect you can have on and a coach can it can can significantly impact in many other areas. Being a CEO, it must be like that that you must measure success on a broader church of. Uh, of things than than just the eighty minutes on a, on well, a Friday. I have to, or a, or I have to, I have to um, you know, example. Um, you know, we've got we've got eleven or twelve teams here now, um, all different abilities. You know, I'm proud of that. Mm-hmm. You know, this week we asked every player to every single player from every single team to bring an Easter egg in. All right, so we end up we need five hundred Easter eggs, mm-hmm. and then these that we go to hospitals. You know. That's that's bigger than a rugby yes, league yeah. result. Yeah. That's an impact on a community. We we can change lives, you know, uh, and th- and that's you know it's these things that that I want to be judged on. Not just not just whether we win on Saints on Friday. It's mm. it's it's changing people's lives. You know, we took a I'm not going to say a gamble on Matt because Matt's had a, a ten year job interview with mm-hmm. me, but um, we've we've. We've changed the course of another bloke's life. Though. Leaders create other leaders, and when you see him flourishing now in the way he's flourishing, it's you know that I'm so proud. I'm so proud. I had the guts to do that. And ju- and just with him playing, there must be twenty, thirty young Chris Radlinskis or want to be Chris Radlinskis, so to speak, at sixteen now, knowing that how what environment you create within this club and what what, what culture you create. Is going to impact on their li- them for the rest of their lives. Absolutely, absolutely. giving them the opportunities. It, of course, of course. It won't all work out right. No, it won't. But it, it won't. But what I will say is, some young players will leave here. Um, and what what they will see is, we, we give them every opportunity. Looked after. You know, we look after them. We look after people. We look after players' families. Um, you know, we do the right thing by people. Um, and again, that's what I should be judged on. Not just yeah. not just on. You know, a loss on Good Friday. Yeah. You know, it's much, it's a much broader um, set of circumstances that I have to work in. Right. Let's let's move on to some questions we've yep. we've got from fans. Obviously, you talked about your relationship with Mister Lennigan mm-hmm. um, and how how he has mentored you into the position that you're in now. Yeah. Recently bought by uh, Mike Danson. What's it What's it like working with Mike? Is he hands on? Is he uh, more relaxed. This question comes from Gary, um, and he just wants to know: is, is there a difference between the two, and and how's it gone? Um, so, I, obviously, these things don't happen overnight. So, this I've probably been working with Mike for probably close to eighteen months now. Uh, even though takeover was only December first last year, uh, very very cool guy, um, very nice guy, very approachable, very invested. Um, the I always find it amazing that uh, we have a monthly board meeting in London mm. uh, and it, Mike, Mike's got this incredible boardroom on, on, on a 40 foot boardroom table massive window overlooking the River Thames and 
the city of London or the backgrounds, and I'm like, people will not realise that decisions on Wigan Rugby are being made in this, you know, one of the yeah. best cities mm. in the world. But it's an incredible, it's an incredible environment. But um, we're, we're well, three or four months into a, a proper working relationship now, and he, he's been excellent to work with. He, want, he wants us to, to um, obviously win on the field and and make the club successful but mm. just as important to him is the role that we have in our community um, doing impact, impactful and meaningful projects that um, can make you know, better lives for the people of our town but very early days uh, very different characters Ian and Mike um, but I'm excited to be working with him so brilliant another question how do you how do you build a squad of of 25 players on the on the cap but the academy and the reserves how how far in advance obviously a lot of people have asked like around particular players is there a succession plan to, mm-hmm. to particular players and how how do you map all that because you can imagine that some players leave out of the blue you get an offer and it, it just changes your entire plan mm-hmm. how far in advance are you working and how do you deal with that situation well, me and Matt will speak about it every single week um, we've got succession uh, floor plans all the way down to 14s, under 14s, people who we're looking at. Uh, we've got an amazing youth system here, which everyone knows about, um, and all the information's getting fed through, and all our successions are updated all the time. Um, but like I said, everyone's out of contract at a diff- different time. Mm. Now more than ever, there's more agents in the game than there's ever been, which um, is a challenge. Um so I think the way the way we do is very proactive rather than reactive to to approaches and things like that. But it's you know people think recruitment happens you know in a certain six week block or what have you. We're literally talking about it every single week. Mm. Um, we we are a salary cap sport. Uh, constantly working with the RFL with other clubs, looking at changes to see what you know what we can do differently in that respect. But it's very very live. And player managers are on to us every single week, but it's it's a challenge because. Of do, do you do you ever feel pressure to make short term decisions, or is it is part of the skill being able to kind of like say, well, look, we may have to just hold our council here a little bit and be patient and get the right person rather than rush in and buy short term. Uh, yeah, I think I think if, you, if 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 you're rushing in or doing anything short term, then you've not done your planning properly. Mm. Um, so, like I said, we're co- we're talking about it all the time. Uh, the, the reason I mention that is, is I remember Ian giving a um, a speech in the fans forum with Joe Lydon at Deanery yeah. in two thousand late two thousand and seven, early two thousand and eight, and he talked about two years. We need two years to let a lot of salary cap decisions filter through the system mm-hmm. to allow us to bring juniors through, recruit better, etc. And I kind of got the feeling that we had a similar position maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago, where we had to like take a slightly longer-term view of, of our recruitment. Mm. And some of the decisions you can make now by handing contracts out to Harry and Jake Wardle, for example, have only been able to be made because of some good decisions 12 months, two years earlier. I mean, I mean the reality is if someone, if someone has a good season, let, let's, let's, take, let's take Junior, for example. Um, we want to return Junior, but... In order to return junior, someone's going to have to fall off the other end. Mm. So someone yeah. will have to leave because we spend right up to cap. So we, we you know, there's it. The challenge we've got at the minute is that um, everyone's playing well. Mm. It's a good, it's a good squad. It's a good place to be. Everyone wants more money. So keeping everyone together for a longer term is 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 another challenge we've got. But it's. It's conversations every, every single day, and you, you you won't get them all right. You know things. It, there are sliding door moments as well. Yeah. You know, we heard whispers on Morgan Smithies um, probably probably very early last year, and we we fought and as hard, not, you know, to retain him. But the reality is, if 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 we would have retained Morgan, we wouldn't have been able to get Luke Thompson. So you you've just got to be, you got to hedge your bets a bit. I think. But being, being proactive and having conversations um, is, is what we do a lot of. And Matt's brilliant. He has got a good network of managers and he's across everything. And, and you talk about <coughs> a player has to go off the other end and, and, and leave the club and whatever. 
do you find that a challenging um, role that that you need to speak to people and say, Luke, y- your future? Um, I, I suppose there's there's two different types. There's ones where the careers are naturally mm-hmm. finishing due to age or, or, or injury, um, but obviously there's situations where the club need to go in a different direction. Yeah. Um, do you find that role challenging? Uh, yeah, it's hard. Difficult. Yeah, it's hard, no doubt about it. But what what I always say is that nothing should come as a surprise. Mm-hmm. So if if you're having a conversation, it's come out of the blue, and you let someone go, then you've not been doing your work leading up to that. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason, ultimately, that they're not going to be with us. It might be form, it might be different direction, it might be injuries, it might be out of end of career, etc. So as long as you, you're having constant conversations and communicating, that makes things easier as well. If we, if if there are surprises in this organisation, then we've not we've not done our job. Communication is not where it needs to be. Now this this last question, I'm going to leave you with one more question, and it sort of links all of these to together with what you just said. Obviously, we're talking about players that are currently in the first team and around the squad. How does it? How do you deal with the academy side of it? Obviously, someone has to. We've got a very successful academy, mm-hmm. and we, we bring players through. But there are players outside of that that don't make it to first team, don't make it to the reserve grade, and and you ultimately have to let them go. Two parts of this. One, how do you come to that decision? Obviously, I'm assuming it's not just you, but it's the entire. Ha- who decides mm-hmm. and what do you offer to that player to, to support them? Obviously, it could be a really devastating moment if you've spent your life trying to be a Wigan Warriors player. How, how do we support them players that potentially don't make it? And, and just, to, just to add to that as well, that, that's a massive turnover because the old John Money adage that only two players will come through yeah, yeah. every year, you, you, you're bringing 20 players through to, to find those two. Yeah. So you've got to deal with 17, 18, it's not one or two. No, no. It, and it happens every year and, it, that, and it's that's experience uh, and you're right, it, that's not a decision that will just fall with me. Matt will be involved. Um, Tommy, Lockers, um, John Duffy, <laughs> Shane Eccles, Joel Tompkins, we, you know, we'll all have a say on and then They'll present the way forward. They w- they want to mm. go, but you're right. Having a, a good exit program is, mm. is is so important. So everybody will have exit interviews. We'll um, we'll already have a, a welfare network and know where they're at emotionally. Mm. Parents will be involved, and then we'll do check ups months gone by. You know, making sure everyone's everyone's okay. But but like I said before, if 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 these are coming as surprise or are out of the blue, then we've not been doing the you know, yeah. So those players have been having feedback oh, throughout they, they, the we, year. They, yeah, they, were they on the curve, so absolutely, to speak? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Regular appraisals, regular feedback all, all the year. Um, and you know what? That's one of the questions we ask at exit interview. Have you been getting your you know enough feedback? And everyone says, yeah, I'm known all the way through where I'm up to. So it's proactivity, really. Mm. Be, being a, in front of that and. Being honest with it. Yeah, but... yeah. Uh, look, look. This is an honest environment. Mm. It, 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 there's no other way it could operate. You have to be, you have to be straight with people, but you have to be prepared to answer questions that come in your way. And uh, this is what I, I, I go back to what I said at the start. We're, we're spending hundred hours a week on this. Well, well, some, something I've, and it might have been off recording that, that you said earlier on about you know Wigan being professional back in the early nineties and what an environment leading the way on lots of things. But professionalism then was nothing compared to now. No, no. And I can imagine in those days people were just told, oh, you're being transferred to wherever, or and it, things came out of the blue, you're not good yeah. enough or whatever. But the pathways, the education, uh, the feedback, talking about those follow-up programmes, that's, yeah. that's amazing to understand that this club still keeps in touch with those players two months, three months, six months, yeah. just to make sure that they're all right, to keep in touch. I just find that... Fantastic and yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, like I said, this it's come a long way. You know, we don't, we, we you know, in the in the performance program now, we we employ scientists. You know, there's nutritionalists, technology players, a big part in what we're doing, and you've got to keep reinventing all these kind of things yeah. because you know that's not slowing down. Mm. You know, the the, the players, um, the players and the staff, they'll they'll all go on, oh, not so much the players, but all staff go on. You know CPD opportunities every single year, visiting different organisations, different sports, etc. But that again comes. They'll all come back and they'll want something different, and they'll want some uh, a new piece of kit or a new piece of equipment or something like that. So it's it's constantly looking at ways in which you don't remain static. 
you can't remain static, not in professional sport. And sometimes that, that sometimes that, that upsets people. You know, it, it does. And I'll go back to the badge. It was it. it, it the thing about the, the rebrand and the badge was it, it to me it's not about whether you like the badge or not. It's about whether you understood the fact that we had to do it. Yeah. The, you know, mm. it, we had to do things differently mm. in a fast changing digital world. And you're going you're gonna you're gonna upset people. Mm. But you are, you have to be you have to be brave enough and have enough conviction to, to, to follow it through. To yeah. understand where we need to be in five years, in ten years. If we if we don't, we're static then mm. you know Somebody said it to me, and I always keep this this phrase close to my mind. In it's the rugby league will never die because too many people love it. Unfortunately, them same people will never let it grow. Mm. Mm. And it's so true. And and you know we love this sport, but we can't we can't tread water. If we tread water, then we'll we'll fade away, fade away, fade away. It's professional sport now. You see it. The, the, it's billion dollar industries, stadium transformations. You know we all saw what happened in the Super Bowl. We all went to Tottenham. What an experience! Well, we have to be brave enough to make decisions, um, and unfortunately, that that upsets people. We, we 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 spoke to Chris last week, and 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 I said one of the things I've always been proud of, proud about most of the club is that we've always tried to be the first. You know, I'm very proud of, of Ian taking us down under to play mm. Sydney Roosters, down under to take a Super League game and play Hull down there, go to Millwall. Yeah be leaders in, in what we try and do and it won't always work in, in, in 100% but I think we're a very forward thinking club yeah we are but but all them games again they're, they're all important but upset loads of people didn't yeah. they you know? yeah. and that's yeah. that's the challenge that's the challenge in, I guess in my role um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm very strong in, in my thought process that if we don't just think a little bit differently then we'll, we'll cease to exist yeah. So we need to keep. I, 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 yeah, sorry, sorry for interrupting. I, I suppose who would have thought three, four years ago we'd be having firework nights or yeah. training under the lights or whatever or whatever it be. But but those things have created a spirit within the fan base that's assisting and taking us forward. Yeah, and we have to do those things. Yeah, well, well we I spoke earlier about the concerts. I'll I'll have to take the players out to their training environment, and you know we'll put them somewhere nice, yeah. but. For ten days, while we put concerts on here, mm. but it's it's revenue. Every it brings extra revenue mm. in, into the business, and players' salaries are going up. Yeah, yeah. Broadcast revenue is going down, so we've got to be creative in how we bring, how we, how we bring, your money. And I think, you know, if if anything about about the rebrand, you know, it's absolutely reinvigorated our retail program. Yeah, yeah. it's like, and the most important thing, and I always upset people by when I say it. Is that kids are buying it? Mm. Kids want it. Mm-hmm. You know, we used to sell baby grows with the old crest on that took up the whole body <laughs> of the baby because it it could not be um, made smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's some all these kind of things that people don't realise. It, it's it's a you know turning over you know one point four million from yeah. eight hundred thousand, but on the back of rebrand and kids buying it, that's future. And that's yeah. why we had to. Mm. Why we had to do it. I suppose it. it's like you said before, going back to that badge, the example, the people who don't like that decision, you can say, you know, well, we had to do it, and they say, well, why? And you say, well, I can explain it to you, but you won't understand. Do you know, they, they, you're not, you not. You can try your best, but in the wider picture, you and your role. It, no, it, no, ta- it must have taken hundreds, of, if not thousands, of hours to come yeah. to those decisions. You yeah. can't yeah. explain it. No, you can't, yeah, you, can't. you can't just put a statement. No, you can't. All I'm, different I'm, reasons I'm, why I'm, it is. Look, listen, know? listen. There is a couple of things we could have done differently. Consultation, but but in a in a in an industry or society that we're in now, we, nothing's quite. Yeah. A, do you know what I mean? Um, I was the face of delivering it, but there's there's probably thirty people, who, you know, within the everything who thought this was the right thing to do, um, and it, you know, it was it was a symbol and it was a new way of working. It was a, it was everything that went behind the badge. I and mean, even if you just walk around this facility now, you can see how we use it. In so yeah. many different ways, so many different styles, uh, retail operation. Again, it's it's going through the roof. Uh, I think it helps that it's on site. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you yeah, can very much potentially so. bump into players. Um, I, I think I think uh, uh, we've got a wonderful manager in there in Nicola Pryor at the moment who does a fantastic job, um, and it's a real growth area for mm. us. But you know, 
I, I, I could talk about it yeah. every single day because I know it was the right thing to do. And that yeah. badge will always be part of us. Of course. Always be part of us. Of course. I, I, I think in your role as CEO, finding that balance about what success means is not, like you said, one thing. It's it's being successful commercially, being successful with your player pathways, being successful in the media, mm -hmm. being successful on the field. There must be so much to it. Yeah, there is. There is, and, and that's that's why I, you know, it's a real privilege. Don't get me wrong. It, it's a pressure job. It's a privilege. It's it takes up my whole life. No doubt about that. Um, but what what a job! What an incredible job! But I'll always be balanced about the results. You know, because I know that. There must be so much you can take out of it, though, in many different ways. Just sitting here and, and, and looking at the spreadsheet one day and finding out that retail's gone up by whatever, that must give you, in some ways, not as much pleasure, but as beating Saints on a good Friday, uh, you, you know. You're 100%. You know, we're, we're professional sport's difficult. And it's difficult at the minute, but it's exciting at the same time. We, I, Getting sports sponsorship is a challenge. Yeah. 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 Now... I was getting comments this year that they didn't like the sponsor's colour. Correct, yeah, yeah. We're not in a position as a sport to say, oh, we're not going with this company because I don't like the colour of your logo. We're not yeah, in that yeah. position as a sport. We cannot. They've paid a hell of a lot of money to go on that shirt. Mm. We're not going to turn it down because of the colour. But people say, oh, that shouldn't be on that colour. Well, guess what? Somebody, somebody's been on Microsoft Paint and knocked something up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but guess what? That money yeah. that the sponsor's giving allows us to retain Jayfield. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, and that's what it kind of frustrates me about, and, and I call it a bit like corner shop mentality. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we all want these global sponsors. We all want them. Do we then turn them down if we don't like the colour of the, mm, no. the logo? It's business, it's revenue, and it allows us to do things. Yeah. It allows us to invest in our... Play a pathway to invest in our facility, um, and again, I, I welcome conversations like this because it it allows me to get my point of view across as yeah. well. You know, yeah. we 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 can't be we can't be naive about about the situation the sport is well, in. We, we have to be doing things differently. We we do very much live in a in an on demand society, don't we? Mm -hmm. that, that people rightly or wrongly expect what they want. At that moment in time immediately etc and you know i always say this that we have we, we have ten thousand coaches every week in the stands and they all agree that matty pete or sean wayne or whoever's picked the wrong team mm -hmm. but you ask them to pick the team and they'd all pick something different yeah but they don't argue with themselves they yeah. all argue with the coach and it's the same with we, i suppose in business that you know, we think we should be wearing this kit. We think we should be signing that play. We think we should be doing X, Y, and Z or whatever. And everybody's got a hundred different ideas, if not thousands of different ideas, and would all implement it differently. Mm. But at the end of the day, an organisation has to move forward together. Mm -hmm. But the, the, other side, vision. the other side of that is that, you know, you have, to, you have to understand what the role of a sports club is as well. Mm. It's people's it's people's escape yeah. from society. Mm. So they're entitled mm. to their opinion. Yeah. You know, and I, it's passion. It's oh, you know, it's we're we're lucky to have such a, a fan base. We're lucky to have so many um educated you know, and I do think our fans are educated. There was there was a point last season where Bevan was not a number six. You know? Yeah. Th that was that happened last year. Well he walked away with Man of Steel. Mm. You know, we we won a grand final with it. Okay, well, what's the next thing? But it's okay, it's okay. That's that's fandom. That's that's support. Um, and what I always say is that when when they, when they stop complaining curry. or curing, yeah, then then we've got then we've got then we've got problems. So yeah, you know we're all, we're okay with it. I think again, this me speaking five years ago will be very different to how I'm speaking mm -hmm. now. I, yeah, it's it's a complete balanced view of. Listening and understanding, and there'll be things that I hear and I see, and I went, yeah, that might be right. That I need to do something different there, mm -hmm. you know. And it's taking views and opinions off everything. Just, ju just one thing I'd like to bring up: um, the COVID years. Yeah. Maybe I'm, 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 I'm well, I don't know how the question is going to come across, um, but I can imagine those being a very, very difficult, hard times for yourself personally. I know lots of people had things to deal with. Um, 
and I'm probably going to name drop here, but I happened to have a 10-minute conversation with Ian Lennigan just as we were coming out of COVID, mm-hmm. and he explained to me how much work you'd put in over those 12, 18 months. Oh, yeah. How do you reflect on that? I mean, I know it took a lot out of you personally, yeah. but, but do you feel proud of how you managed that situation and got the club to come out the other side? Yeah, look, look, it's... Um... I always say the sport wasn't in a great place before COVID, but COVID mm. put us on the on the edge. So we, I worked all the way through COVID. You know, I, I was um, there's probably four or five people here who did, um, and we had to, you know, we had to have difficult conversations. I had to have a Zoom on my own with thirty five players, telling them I'm, I'm, I have to reduce the wages, um, and they drilled me for two and a half hours on every element of the business. You know, and I, but I had to be prepared for that for that mm. conversation. You know, no one will ever. That's the hardest thing I've ever had to do, because basically they were saying, "I've signed a contract. You want this?" But guess what? We get our money from people coming watching. No one can come and watch. We've got mm. sponsors pulling mm. out. Sponsors going out of business. Well, guess what? We've got a retail operation. I can't open the retail store. All our revenue angles, the broadcasting distributions were reduced. There was no no games on telly. We're a business on revenue. I've not money to pay you, and you know, obviously, Ian, he 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 was he was the benefactor at the top. Who yeah. he asked, I had to fund everything, so I was putting incredible pressure on him. So I, I was dealing with Ian, but I was very conscious that, you know, I could see it wearing on him as well. Um, but people, it's not just this is this is me at this club, but I know that throughout rugby league and throughout Super League. There are people in my position who, who had to get help because of the, the stressful situation, which is awful, really. Um, and But it, again, we, we, then we started playing and then, you know, we'd lose a few games. And that some, of the, some of the letters I'd get were awful. Yeah. And the, some letters would say, don't blame COVID, but... And I'm like, don't... What do you think would... I'm not bothered about the results on the field. Mm. Putting a team on the field is the most important thing. Having a club here to support is the most important. Mm. I don't care if they win or lose. People don't say all that. Yeah. You know. And I, you know, one thing one thing about this job, certainly my job is the letters people write are mind blowing. You know, you don't get many letters of thanks, but people like writing letters of anger and things mm. like that, which is which is sad and unfortunate. But I, I can see I can see why because it's passion and care, but you know, the, the COVID letters were, were were just were not balanced at all. And that. Yeah, I, I, the, so I don't know if you're aware of this, but something happened after the World Cup Challenge where two of our fans wrote to Penrith. Right. Yeah, and 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 praised them for the for the for the uh, the way the players reacted, the mm-hmm. management were how they how they dealt with the whole thing, and 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 Penrith came out and said like, you know, it's an amazing letter to write mm-hmm. and whatever. And it's in a, in a world where it's so easy to, I think somebody says that something like. Thirty-five people complain where one yeah. actually praises or whatever. To, to, to have the foresight as an individual, whoever those individuals were, to write to yeah. the Penrith club and, and, and praise them because they were fantastic. They, they, they were there's brilliant. No doubt about it. And I do think that that's something that, as a society, we probably need to to learn a little bit better to have mm. you know empathy and, and 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 praise people when things are going well. Just don't take it and expect it. You know, yeah. th- th- there is a thing there and. You know, I, I, I know personally, um, in the fans forum thing, I was lucky to get one of the 100 tickets or whatever it was, and I remember at the end of it just saying, thank you to Mr Lennon, thank mm-hmm. you. It's his money. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and... and, yeah. and but, but, you know, people don't, because people don't have all the information. Yeah. Um, which, if people have not got the information, then that's our that's, fault. That, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that's why our comms have got to be better. So that's why stuff like this is really useful for me, because mm-hmm. you can give people, you know... A, a, Far greater story, but you know, first of all, Penrith were amazing to work with, very, very classic club, and you can see why they've been successful. Um, but we're living in a world now where everyone's got an opinion, and sometimes you find yourself having to defend rumour, which is not a healthy place to be. No. Having to defend rumours, no. which is just bonkers. Because if you get a re- provoke a response, then yeah. then you're going to put more out there, right? Yeah, and and sometimes you know, I think we. We want to be a big sport, don't we? But sometimes, yeah. sometimes you think, can we ever be a big sport? Because if someone sends us a, pr- a private message, we we can't we can't we can't re- reply to every single message. We can't yeah. because you get that many. 
Um, Man United aren't, re- aren't repl- replying to every single... Mm. It, but we've got to be better with our communication. Yeah. And I accept that. And I think that's something that we'll constantly be working on and, and assessing. Um, but it's a challenge, but it's a great challenge and a great privilege. Right. Thank you very much, Chris. It's been an absolute honour to uh, get this sit-down with you. Um, we really appreciate it. And, and thank you very much for coming on. Good, I've really enjoyed it. It's very useful for me, so I'll keep listening. It's good. Yeah, thank you very much. All good. Thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed. Cheers. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm Matty. And I'm Lewis. This is the Wigan Way, Wigan's favourite rugby league podcast.